My name is Isla Skinner. I'm the chair of the urology program at Stanford and just recently arrived. Um, and I wanted to welcome all of you for, to this uh, uh, little seminar this morning and thank you all for coming and, and participating with us. Um, our plan is to have three fairly brief talks about different aspects of prostate cancer and then hopefully have a lot of time at the end for questions. I know a lot of you probably have had some experience or family members who've had prostate cancer and may have questions. Um, we will have lots of time to, to answer them. If you're um, not comfortable speaking your question, there are pads of paper and you're welcome to write a question on there and just pass it down to the end. You can fold it up, pass it down to the end and our, our folks will collect them and then the panel members can address uh, those questions. So I wanted to start by just giving a teeny bit of overview, and I think Dr. Chung is gonna also talk about a little of this as well, um, just to sort of set the background, and then I'll introduce our panel members. So prostate cancer facts, um, there are about 240,000 cases every year. Uh, it's the most common cancer in men other than skin cancer. Uh, there's about 28,000 deaths, and you can see right away that most people who have prostate cancer don't die of it, which is great, um, but it's not a, a small number of patients who do, and so we, one of our focuses is to try to obviously impact those patients particularly. Um, most patients today are diagnosed with either a blood test, a PSA blood test, or an exam. It's unusual to, to be diagnosed because of symptoms. But when you are, the symptoms that prostate cancer causes, unfortunately, are very similar to common symptoms that men have just from an enlarged prostate. So urinary problems and so on can happen from either prostate cancer or enlarged prostate, and it obviously takes a trip to the physician to figure out which of those things is, is happening. Um, Back in the day before we had PSA testing, we would often see men who presented actually with symptoms of cancer that had spread already, but that's pretty unusual now. So the natural history of prostate cancer, so it starts obviously in the prostate, and you're gonna see lots of pictures that, that are similar to this, but basically the prostate is sitting right below the bladder, and it's often described as being walnut-sized, which sort of silly to me, but anyway, that's the way people describe it. And it's right ab above the sphincter muscle, which is here at the base. And the natural history is that the cancer sits in the prostate for many years. Um, we think that the beginnings of prostate cancer might even start in your 30s or 40s, slowly growing. And then eventually, if it's allowed to, to continue to grow, it will spread usually to the lymph nodes that are around the prostate. And then from then, from there, it typically will go to the bones. And that's one of the things that's kind of unique about prostate cancer is it doesn't really often go anywhere else. That's by far the most common. So, so what are some of the questions that we're gonna try to address today? There are many, many, many controversies about prostate cancer. And one of the things that I think patients find the most frustrating is that if you're facing the disease and you go to 10 different doctors, you're almost gonna get 10 different opinions about what to do. And that, I realize, is, is very difficult. So there's a, a big controversy right now that you might be aware of from just reading the paper about who should be screened or should we screen anybody for prostate cancer. Um, we're not, I don't gonna think, gonna touch on that too much today, but we can certainly address it in the questions. If you diagnose with prostate cancer, who needs to be treated? If you're going to be treated, what's the best treatment? And you'll find that that is not a simple question with a simple answer. And what are the treatment options on the other end of the disease? If this cancer actually grows and spreads to the bones, for example, we're gonna talk about some of the very exciting new things that are out there just in the last few years as treatment options uh, for advanced prostate cancer. So the, the um, I was gonna go back to our first slide, but I probably can't figure out how to do that. Um, our uh, panel members, how did you do that bit easy? There you go. Our panel members who I'd like to introduce, and if you all can stand up uh, as I introduce you. 
So our first speaker is Ben Chung, who's one of the urologists in our department. And Ben did his training at Leahy Clinic back east and then did a fellowship in, at Cleveland Clinic in minimally invasive and robotic surgery and specializes in that area and, and is going to talk about today um, really watchful waiting and, and why are we sometimes telling patients that they don't need to be treated for prostate cancer. Second is Mark Gonzalgo also one of the urologists in our department. And Mark, I knew from USC where he was a medical student and got an MD and a PhD there, then went on to Johns Hopkins for his residency, then Memorial Sloan Kettering for a fellowship in urologic cancer or urologic oncology, and then back to Johns Hopkins for a few years until he was recruited here at Stanford in 2009. And finally, Dr. Srinivas, who is our medical oncologist, um, Dr. Srinivas did her training back in uh, New York and then did an uh, oncology fellowship in, at uh, San Francisco and has been at Stanford for 15 plus years and has been really the cornerstone of urologic medical oncology um, treating prostate cancer in its more advanced stages and she's going to talk about that part of the disease. So without further ado, Dr. Chung, I'd like you to come on up touched on um, in her introduction, prostate cancer is kind of um, a cancer that has lots of controversies and, you know, nowadays contemporary discussion has focused on active surveillance and to some extent screening. They are kind of one in one, hand in hand. And I'm going to briefly touch on that to make sure that um, some of those issues are, are elucidated for you as the audience because it can be somewhat confusing as a as a patient, how to decide what to do next and what your options are. So as an outline for this talk, I want to really define what active surveillance means to you as a patient, um, review the rationale for performing active surveillance, uh, and uh, the context you know, amidst recent history, recent studies, recent literature that um, kind of underline why we should be doing something like this, uh, the current status and future directions of active surveillance as well. So what is active surveillance? Well, active surveillance is born out of uh, something called watchful waiting, and they are different in what their intent is and what the uh, protocol is. So watchful waiting is something that came about uh, really in patients who were, you know, had limited life expectancy, um, and uh, patients who had known prostate cancer who we did not think the prostate cancer would uh, shorten their lifespan. So what does that mean? Well, you know, it means basically watching the cancer by following uh, generally PSAs and, and digital rectal exams, prostate exams, to make sure that uh, there's no evidence of spread. And if there is evidence of spread, treating that appropriately, usually with hormonal therapy, in other words, shots to knock testosterone out of the system, which will stop cancer, prostate cancer, at least for a time, from proliferating, growing, and spreading. So that's the old concept. What's newer is active surveillance which is a lot more proactive and it's a lot more involved. What it involves is basically very close monitoring uh, of early prostate cancer, early prostate cancer, while still confined to the prostate and treating the cancer when there are signs of disease activity, uh, but the cancer is still localized. So basically it's, it's you know, and I'll get into this more as the talk goes on, but it's basically trying to um, delay treatment until absolutely necessary because the fact of the matter is we don't really know how long cancer can lay latent in the prostate. And in some situations, we believe it can lay latent in the prostate for quite some time. So Dr. Skinner showed you a kind of a diagram of the prostate where it is. Um, this is a little bit more of a detailed color uh, map. Um, it's not Mr. Robinson, Mr. Uh, no. Rogers, Rogers. Mr. Robinson's the Saturday Night Live ripoff of Mr. Rogers. But anyway. That, <laughs> That, that being said, the, the prostate, you know, a lot of patients ask me, well, why do I have a prostate? Well, really just for reproductive, uh, reproductive uh, health really alone. It produces the vast majority of seminal fluid. And it lies, as Dr. Skinner mentioned, between the bladder and the urethra. So it's a little bit harder to see here, but <clears throat> let's see if I can get this thing to work. There we go. So here's the, um, here's the bladder right here. And the prostate lies in front of the bladder between the, uh, uh, between the bladder and the uh, urethra here. Um, and I would say the, the, the reason why we're having this controversy about treating prostate cancer is, you know, yeah, it's a more 
indolent, less aggressive cancer than a lot of ones that you know, most patients are used to dealing with. And you know, when you hear the word cancer, obviously that sets off kind of a visceral reaction, and that's normal. Um, that being said, because of the indolent nature, you, know, you have to weigh the side effects of treatment with prostate cancer. And what are the side effects? Well, in general terms, there are urinary side effects, uh, namely incontinence, and erectile side effects, namely erectile dysfunction. Why do those occur? Well, it kind of has to do with where the prostate is in the body. Um, of course, the prostate's very close to the urethra, and the sphincter that controls your urinary incontinence is very close to where the prostate enters into the urethra. So by performing some sort of modality treatment, whether it's radiation or surgery, they, there can be some impact on urinary incontinence because of that. Now, these yellow structures down here, these are nerves. And those are the nerves that control erections, erections. Um, they don't control sensation or anything like that, but they control erections. And basically how they do that is they, they govern how much blood flows into the penile structures during erection. Um, those nerves, as you can see, are very close to the prostate. And you know, what I generally tell patients is that, yes, you know, they're close. And, you know, things are not necessarily going to be better after any sort of local therapy. They may be close to what, they're, you know, what they were before, but they're not going to be better because of the proximity of these nerves um, to the prostate. And that's, you know, I think that's why there's a lot of controversy about, about treatment of prostate cancer, especially in a cancer that might be fairly indolent, non-aggressive because of the side effect profile that treatment can cause. Um, this is a quote from Willett Whitmore, who um, many of you probably don't know who he is, but he was... I would say, one of the leaders of urologic oncology. Um, but this quote is from about 30 years ago. Um, and even back then, I think, people realized that there was a quote-unquote central paradox of prostate cancer. In other words, you know, you have cancers, obviously, as Dr. Skinner pointed out, that, that will kill people, that will shorten their lifespan, but you have a lot of cancers that won't. And even then, before PSA screening was really accepted or even known, he made this comment, he made this quote, which was, for a patient with prostate cancer, if treatment for cure is necessary, is it possible? If possible, is it necessary? In other words, if you have advanced prostate cancer, sometimes, you know, even especially back then, trying to do something about it was hard, hard to, um, to cure. But in this, in, there are a lot of other situations in, uh, encapsulated in this, this short phrase, if possible, is it necessary? In other words, do you need to treat all these cancers? And I think we're going to get to that. But I think the answer is, you know, we're finding out that we may be able to kind of keep things uh, on an active surveillance level and not treat them and, and be OK. Um, so as I mentioned, that quote was, um, was uh, created prior to PSA screening. And, um, but you'll see here what PSA screening caused from a diagnosis standpoint of prostate cancer. So here's kind of a, the red lines prostate cancer diagnoses between 1975 and 2004. And you see there was a big spike right about mm, early 1990s, which you know, coincides with PSA screening, and when PSA screening really became a standard of care for men over age of 50. Um, so basically, what you're seeing here is that you know, we suddenly started diagnosing a lot more prostate cancers. And the reason is just because we were able to find them better with PSA, but we were probably finding, and, and we'll get to that as we go on, probably finding a lot of cancers that were less aggressive, um, leading to a lot of diagnoses of, of localized prostate cancer, um, not lethal prostate cancer. So, and you know, as you can see, there was this big spike f with the PSA screening era initiating, then kind of leveling off, which is kind of where we are today. Um, so that was kind of what happened with PSA screening. And I th again, with PSA screening, I think we started finding more and more lower stage, less aggressive cancers. Uh, what we saw as well was a uh, decrease in death rates. Um, this, is, this orange line is the prostate cancer death rate um, um, per year between, uh, I guess, 1930 and, and very recently. And you'll see that you know, it took a little bit of time for the death rate to go down, which you expect with a cancer like prostate cancer. But eventually, it did start to decrease and continues to decrease. So I think that you know, we are doing a good job in detecting prostate cancers. And I think we're doing a better job in trying to um, decrease the death rate from them. But we are, again, I think, finding a lot of prostate cancers that are localized and you know, potentially could be localized for a reasonable long, reasonably long period of time. You know, I think the concept of uh, watching or not treating prostate cancer is not new. 
And again, Dr. Skinner alluded to the fact that, you know, these things could, the prostate cancers in your body could have been there for a long time. Well, this is kind of borne out with autopsy studies. And this is from 1994, um, prostate cancer and autopsy by age. It's a little bit startling to think that a 30-year-old could have a 30% chance of having prostate cancer. But, you know, I think that when we think about prostate cancer, that's not implausible. I mean, I think, again, we're talking about a cancer that does kill, you know, people, but in a lot of patients just kind of stays indolent and, and latent for a good long period of time. And as you can see, as the age of the patient goes up, not surprisingly, the incidence of finding prostate cancer and autopsy goes up as well. So I think there's an estimate that someone in their 80s probably has an 80% chance of harboring some prostate cancer. And again, that 80% of people age 80 are not going to die of prostate cancer. So I think there's a lot of prostate cancer out there. We're doing a better job in finding them, but we're probably finding some that could stay latent for some period of time. Interestingly enough, the most common cause of death among men with prostate cancer is actually cardiovascular disease. Um, and this kind of goes into the concept of what we would call competing risks. In other words, you know, as we age, there are other things that could potentially shorten our lifespan. And, you know, most people, ultimately, it's either going to be, it's going to be cardiovascular disease. And that's probably changing now with, you know, other epidemiologic factors. But nonetheless, I think the point of the matter here is that, um, you know, of the 200 or so thousand diagnoses, 28,000 deaths, you know, a lot of patients are not going to die of prostate cancer. They're going to die of something that would otherwise take their lifespan had the prostate cancer not even been there in the first place. Um, screening is a whole big topic that, you know, would probably take, uh, you know, the remainder of this uh, entire session. So I'm going to briefly touch on that here. Um, yes, there's a controversy of how, whether we should screen patients or not with PSA. You know, I think basically, you know, I showed that the prostate cancer death rate was diminishing with PSA screening. Um, but, you know, the, the argument is that, you know, we're not, um, we're, we're adding too much morbidity by treating. We're, we're over-treating patients. And uh, by doing so, you know, we're actually causing harm. So, you know, there are two separate studies out there to try to answer, is screening helpful or not? And one was conducted here in the United States and one was conducted in, in Europe. I would say right off the bat, the study that was conducted here in the United States did not show a difference in patients whether they were screened or not. That study had some, some serious flaws to it, and you know, first and foremost, I think the, the most obvious flaw is that most of those patients, or all of those patients, almost all those patients who were in that trial were already screened with PSA. And as you can see, we took out a lot of those patients who were the higher risk patients um, back in the early 90s from the onset of, of PSA screening. So I think the more valid um, uh, study is the one from Europe, where there isn't kind of uniform PSA screening, uh, you'll see that the screening group actually seems to uh, be better, uh, sorry, the, the screening group seems to be better off, at least in the short term. In other words, they are randomized to screening or not being screened and, and seeing what their, what their death from prostate cancer was. Um, this difference was not significantly different yet but it seems to be diverging. In other words, you know, I think maybe if we give it some more years, you'll see that there's, a, there's advantage to screening, but we don't know that yet. However, what we do know from that analysis is that, is right here. Basically, in their statistics, they found that 48 men needed to be operated on to save one man's life. So again, I think there's a, you know, there's a, there's a large portion of prostate cancers that may not, may not shorten one's lifespan. And, our job is to do a better job in finding out which ones those are. So where are we now? Well, you know, as I mentioned, prostate cancer, at least in the United States, has changed, and we're finding a lot of uh, lower, smaller, uh, low-grade cancers. Um, the, the Easter surveillance has not really increased that much, um, at, you know, to account for that. And I think that the data, as the data starts to accumulate, I think we sh we will be doing more and more of that, um, for the reasons I mentioned before. A big problem with prostate cancer is that our current measures of risk are inaccurate. In other words, this is a cancer we actually cannot see on any sort of imaging study with any sort of uh, ver um, uh, validity or reliability. So we're kind of we kind of have to go a step back to try to diagnose these things. And you know, we're using PSAs as I mentioned. We're doing biopsies. You know, uh, if you could see the cancer, we wouldn't biopsy them, obviously. So, you know, and biopsy inherently is going to have some error to it. So um, we have to deal with that with prostate cancer, especially from a, um, from a uh, monitoring standpoint. So, you know, uh, from, from an active surveillance standpoint, there are 
uh, it's kind of a burgeoning uh, literature in the efficacy, the safety of doing something like this. And that can be, it's a, a, bit, of, it's a bit of a busy slide, but uh, these are kind of the criteria, and I'll summarize in a slide after, that most people have used to um, stratify or select patients who would be good candidates for watchful waiting, sorry, for active surveillance. Basically, it's clinical stage less than T2, in other words, non-palpable, can't feel anything in the prostate. PSA of less than 10. This group from the UK, PSA less than 15. UK is a whole different story, and I'll get to that later, but basically the, the UK does not use PSA screening, so they're not going to find a lot of patients probably who could fit into this category. Um, Gleason grade, generally Gleason 6, Gleason 6 or less, and 6 is about as low as it gets, so low-risk cancers. Uh, minimal amount of cores, generally we get 12 cores, 2 cores or less, sometimes 3, you know, to indicate a small volume of cancer. Uh, you know, single cores, less than 50%. In other words, small fo focus is a cancer in each core, not the whole core involved, just a little bit of it. And other, other measures of PSA, which are a little bit more esoteric. Now, I want to mention here the Royal Marsden Hospital, which is in London. Again, PSA screening is not, um, is not mandatory, even w widely practiced in the UK. And because of that, most patients are going to be found at, at higher stages, maybe non-curable stages. What percentage of the men diagnosed in the United States could be candidates for active surveillance? About 33, 33 to 36%, about a third. How about the UK? About 9%, about 9%. So again, to, you know, this is a whole other discussion, but to kind of abandon PSA screening, I think, is a bad idea. Um, yes, we can overtreat patients if we kind of don't adhere to the principles of the prostate cancer itself, and maybe it's not that aggressive, but I think that abandoning PSA screening altogether is not a great idea. We'll just basically see that death rate, I think, go back up to was pre-PSA screening levels. Again, who qualifies for active surveillance? I pretty much put it down here in black and white, but basically low-risk cancers, low volume, Gleason 6, which is about as low as it gets. Um, there are some intermediate-risk patients Generally, um, these are, you're going to find these in countries like the UK, where you're not going to have a lot of candidates for really low-risk cancer. Uh, the patient really must be uh, willing to engage in rigorous follow-up. In other words, you know, this is something that we need to follow as closely as possible to ensure that everything stays confined to the prostate. And yes, there's going to be some risk, just like anything we do. There's going to be some risk assumed by following, following cancer, because we don't have um, great measures to know 100% whether the cancer is still confined or not. There are several series out there. This is the latest update. Um, these series range from 200 to 900, close to 1,000 patients. Um, Follow-up ranges from about two years to over seven. Um, basically, we'll get to the number treated, but basically what you'll find here is that the prostate cancer survival, or, or basically dying from prostate cancer from patients who are in this trial is very, very low, very, very low. So, you know, yes, we need more follow-up, we need more patients, but I think basically if we select patients carefully, what the data is showing is if we select patients carefully and follow them, follow them carefully, follow them closely, then we assume not that much risk. Not that much risk. Not zero, but not very much risk. So how do we follow up patients? Well, PSA, you know, obviously, you know, PSA, that's the easiest blood test. Do we know how to really use that from an active surveillance standpoint? Not really. but. Of course, if PSA starts to accelerate and rise very quickly, that makes us a little more concerned and um, you know, maybe tells us that we maybe should re-biopsy the patient to make sure that something is not getting larger and um, potentially not curable. Imaging, again, as I touched on, we don't have a great imaging modality that we can actually see prostate cancer. Once we can see prostate cancer in some sort of imaging modality, then everything will change. But right now, we don't have that, so we have to rely on biopsy, basically. Follow-up biopsy, which is the only modality we have really to follow patients. And, you know, the frequency of biopsy, you know, that can range, but generally I recommend that patients get biopsied uh, within the first year after the diagnosis if they're going to undergo active surveillance to make sure that we have the best uh, ability to know what's going on in the shortest period of time. Uh, this is a uh, paper from uh, Laurie Klotz, who's at the University of Toronto. He's got probably one of the largest series out there from an active surveillance standpoint. I think he's got something like 900 patients, but basically what he found was that there was no difference in overall survival or prostate cancer specific survival in those patients that he was following on active surveillance. Um, there also, um, 
I'll get to this, but this is uh, Bal Carter from Hopkins. Um, basically, what percentage of patients need to be treated while they're on active surveillance? I would say it's about 33%, about a third, ultimately get some sort of treatment um, while they're on active surveillance. And why would that, why do they get treated? What are the reasons? Well, PSA is rising. You know, you rebiopsy the patient, you think they have a Gleason 6, they actually have a Gleason 7 or higher. You know, that would be obviously be an impetus to, for you to intervene at that point. Um, you now feel a nodule on the prostate, obviously that's a reason to intervene. Um, you rebiopsy the patient, and all of a sudden they have a lot more cancer, again, another reason to intervene. You know, patient preference, you know, there is, right, there is some risk and there can be some anxiety involved from a patient, patient standpoint. And some patients, the anxiety does get to them and they say, look, I, I, I understand. Um, but I really want something to be done. So, you know, that's a you know, perfectly uh, reasonable explanation. Uh, ureteral obstruction, that would be more indicative of a much more aggressive process, and that's obviously very, very unlikely, 0.4%. So there are a variety of reasons why patients end up getting definitive therapy, whether it's radiation or surgery, and here are kind of the, the main reasons. However, what we... Yeah, that was, this, is from, this is from the uh, Toronto study. Yeah. So about, about 15%, 14% of the total cohort. Yeah, 14% cohort were positive for prostate cancer? No, they, they, they intervened because their PSA started to accelerate. There was intervention done because their PSA started to accelerate. Um, the good news is that, you know, we don't have a lot of data, but, you know, those patients who do get surgery after being on active surveillance, um, as I mentioned, about a third do get intervention. Um, we didn't see, they haven't seen any difference in survival. So the good news is that for now, it appears that getting surgery later does not impact your ability for cure. So we do need more patients. We do need, do need more follow-up. That's what we're finding right now. So what's next? Well, you know, we don't, the, I think the major issue here is we don't, we can't really predict the behavior of individual prostate cancers, and we need to be better at doing that. So we need to better sort out those cancers that are going to stay latent and those who are not. And we're not there yet, but we're, we're getting there, and that's going to take uh, some work, and whether that's more gene um, genotyping, you know, trying to find what genes are turned on and off in certain cancers, or other tests, you know, that's in process. Uh, I talked about this. You know, we can't predict behavior of prostate cancer. We can't predict if and when and or if low-risk cancers become more aggressive. And again, biopsy is the most accurate, but still inherently inaccurate. Um, so I'm just gonna make a plug for our prostate cancer active surveillance trial here. Um, basically, we ha we're involved here at Stanford in a, in a multi-center trial of uh, active surveillance. Um, our goal is to get to 1,000 patients with five years of follow-up. I think we're at 900-something patients. So and I think we have about 100 or so patients here at Stanford. So. You know, for those, uh, I think this is the way to do it these days. For those who are going to undergo active surveillance, it's good to be involved in a clinical trial where follow-up is assiduous and, and um, it's consistent and, um, you know, that you're subject to a very uh, close level of scrutiny when it comes to, um, comes to the uh, follow-up that you need. But basically, it involves, just as we mentioned, PSAs, exams, and, and routine biopsies to make sure that we know as well as we can what's going on. Uh, again, we do need better imaging, better biomarkers to really detect the cancers that uh, we think were going to be problems. But to summarize and conclude, uh, it is a viable option, motivated men with low-risk prostate cancer. It appears safe, according to the data we have right now. Um, about a third of men who are on active surveillance will need treatment in five years. Uh, and we do need better tools to, to uh, better predict those cancers which will become um, more problematic as time goes on. Thanks very much. Should we leave the questions for later? I, I think what I'd like to do is to have all the questions at the end and we'll all be up there because then you can get multiple opinions on everything. So if you, don't, if you want to jot down questions that are burning right this minute and then uh, we'll get to those at the end. So next is uh, Dr. Gonzalo who's going to talk some about surgical treatment.
out. Uh, what we want to focus on today, uh, at least for the next attention on uh, surgical There are really a number of treatment options for localized disease. The first treatment option that many people are uh, familiar with, and hopefully even more so after this morning's talk, is that of expectant management, or what we call active surveillance. One of the next steps that we can also take against localized prostate cancer is the use of radiation therapy, whether it's external beam radiation or for seed therapy. The, um, uh, and the, the last uh, treatment option, which I'll focus on, is really surgery. And surgery can come in many different forms. It can come uh, via retropubic, or what's considered to be the open, uh, classic approach. Uh, many folks have heard about robotic or laparoscopic approaches. And then there was also a lesser-known perineal approach, uh, which a was actually one of the, the first ways that surgeons uh, removed the gland. And I'll touch upon at the end of the talk just very briefly about potential future applications of treatment for localized disease, uh, those therapies known uh, as ablative therapies, HIFU, which is a high-intensity focused ultrasound, or cryoablation. Now, the three main goals of treatment, I believe, uh, regardless of which technique, whether it's radiation or surgery that you would like to use for treatment of prostate cancer, uh, I think are going to be number one, first and foremost, cancer control. And then, uh, as we mentioned earlier uh, in, in the first talk, that any treatment can pose potential risks. And the risks, the two main risks that men are uh, frequently uh, concerned about are the impact uh, of the treatment on their ability uh, to preserve the urinary control and also uh, the impact on, on sexual function. Uh, again, we'll get into a little bit of anatomy uh, review. Uh, the prostate, again, this schematic shows a very large tumor. And I wanted to show this slide so people get an understanding. Uh, even Dr. Chung mentioned earlier about the neurovascular bundles, uh, which are responsible for, for uh, allowing a man to achieve uh, erections. Uh, those lie kind of behind the prostate and to the side. And one can see that if you're doing what we uh, have called a nerve sparing operation where we try to preserve those functions, that we would probably make our cut or incision closer to the prostate. And if there was a concern for tumor involvement or extension, one would then make a wider plane of dissection. And you can see uh, there are a lot of very delicate structures around the prostate. The rectum sits right behind it. And that's why during a physician rectal exam, uh, we can actually feel uh, potentially tumors uh, or abnormalities of the gland uh, if they are present. Uh, this is a whole mount, kind of what a pathologist might look at once a prostate has been removed. I think it gives us a very good understanding of, again, the, what uh, an anatomy is involved. The black line surrounds the actual gland itself, and you can see that prostate cancer is typically what we call multifocal. It's not necessarily confined only to one area of the prostate, and it can actually exist as discrete sections, and that uh, it can be on both sides of the gland and, and different areas of the gland. You'll also notice there's extra tissue here on this side, and in this particular case would represent a situation where the neurovascular bundle uh, would have been excised, and there was a wider plane of dissection, uh, perhaps because of uh, uh, you know, abnormalities, cancer control, or biopsy results. And then on this side of the gland, there was a much closer plane of dissection, uh, leaving a, a neurovascular bundle intact. Now, uh, with uh, advances in technology, and people may have heard of, of things and, and progress uh, through different surgical approaches, uh, this is uh, one of the common or more uh, commonly utilized techniques for surgical removal of the prostate, which is the, uh, the robot, uh, also known as da Vinci. Uh, you can see it's a very unique situation when it was first introduced in the early 2000s and uh, that the surgeon is actually separate from the patient. Uh, and it's also something that I emphasize to, to patients that, you know, it's not as if you press a button and the robot does the operation. It's still dependent upon the surgeon who's operating uh, the tools. And so what we need to kind of take a step back and look at this and put it in perspective is that the robot is just an extension. It's just another surgical tool. It's a little more fancy than the scalpel itself but it's really entirely dependent upon the surgeon. That's a theme that I want to come back to uh, over and over um, as we discuss. I mean, it does have some fancy bells and whistles. You know, it takes uh, advantage of the latest technology. One primary reason why pure, what we call pure laparoscopic surgery, wasn't 
um, as applicable as a, a robotic sur surgery is the fact that it, you know, you're operating in a very delicate environment and the instrumentation with a robot just allows for more precision. Uh, obviously you're operating in a very unique situation where you're able to view the anatomy in three dimensions. Uh, you can s actually scale movement so if you should have a tremor or some reason you can actually get rid of it with a robot if needed. And of course there's ergonomics of surgeons sitting down and, and really there's potential in the future for application of additional technologies based on visualization and really uh, adapting it to uh, the visual and audio equipment uh, in the robot uh, to improve uh, techniques. Uh, again, th this is kind of a, a video to depict how the trocars or the access into the patient is completely separate and the surgeon will look into a console uh, that's in high definition in three dimensions uh, to perform the operation. All of the tools are controlled uh, basically by the instruments at the console and again it allows for uh, this type of movement uh, with the uh, surgical tools such that you can actually uh, suture uh, in, in this way in a very pre pre precise manner. And this, this will be the last anatomy slide, if you will, or schematic. We know that the prostate here sits deep within the pelvis. As Dr. Chung pointed out earlier, as well as Dr. Skinner, it's between the bladder and what we call the urethra at the end here, with the nerve bundles to the side, but actually much closer to the prostate. And when you remove the prostate, uh, we want to try to preserve uh, neurovascular bundles, if applicable or if possible, and also avoid injury to the, uh, the sphincter. And it, it, it's not as easy as, as plucking it out like that. <laughs> I wish it was. Uh, th the second part to any surgical approach is the reconstruction. That's where you have to reconnect the urethra back uh, to the bladder, and a catheter sits there. Um, as depicted, so definitely not that easy. Now, this is some actually uh, surgical uh, footage, and I just wanted to show this so you can get a better understanding. This is the actual prostate here. It sits behind layers of tissue that need to be accessed and again carefully dissected uh, free in order to remove the, the prostate. So this is the left side of the gland. Uh, we'll look at the right side, and the, the next um, uh, piece will depict actually uh, kind of a nerve sparing uh, situation here. So now this is the right side of the gland, the prostate's here. There's always a little bit of bleeding, but not a whole lot, at least in this case. You can see the nerve bundle is going to actually lie in this piece of tissue right here. And you're going to see it's almost like skinning an onion peel, or, 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 or if you will, shelling uh, the gland out in order to try to preserve uh, this uh, fine uh, veil of tissue uh, that's on the right. And so you can see here as the, the prostate's being mobilized to the left, uh, we'll be able to appreciate, uh, again, a level of tissue here uh, where the nerve lies. So it's not as if you have a, a road map for uh, nerves, uh, and it's something that not necessarily all patients will be candidates for. A lot's going to depend on the type of cancer that's present, uh, the amount of cancer that's present or identified on biopsy, and of course, the PSA level and your clinical exam. But you can see, uh, as the scissors are going to be passed underneath here, this plane of tissue or veil is where the neurovascular bundle lies and that the prostate is here to the left and we're really almost in a sense dissecting the prostate away from the nerves uh, in, our, in order to preserve that type of function. Once the prostate's out, as you saw in the cartoon, you have to put things back together and this is where I think the, uh, the robotic instrumentation uh, is uh, really uh, shown in its full capacity. That's the ability to use suture to connect or reconnect the bladder back to the urethra. So again, I just wanted to show this is the last video of how that would work in order to try to reconstruct or reconnect the bladder to the urethra. Uh, we can do what's called a watertight anastomosis or reconnection, and the catheter is shown here. That allows a catheter to stay in there for just about a week uh, while things heal up before it's removed. So this is just, uh, again, one example of a patient who actually healed very nicely. Uh, this is after surgery, uh, a couple of months afterwards. We will usually make an incision, whether it's above the belly button, around the belly button, and uh, they'll have a few more uh, trocar posts here. I think in men as well it helps because most guys are pretty hairy down there, so the hair grows back and, and it kind of uh, hides things or, or covers things up. I think the pathway for surgery has kind of been streamlined uh, even uh, for the open uh, surgical approach. In many cases, both the open and robotic surgery, uh, even though this listed here just for robotic prostatectomy is an overnight uh, hospital stay. Uh, there's 
rarely need for any type of blood uh, transfusion, and we don't typically uh, donate blood products um, prior to the operation, and that goes both for the open or robotic approach. OR time uh, is variable. I think the catheter time tends to be a little less for the uh, robotic in general just because of the type of anastomosis that can be done um, uh, by uh, the, the suturing uh, that's performed during the actual operation. But again, this is a variable, and it can vary anywhere from about a week to two weeks. And when you talk about outcomes with robotic prostatectomy, we have to understand what we're really comparing to. We need to be comparing to the gold standard. And what's the gold standard? Well, it's the, the technique that's been around the longest, the one that we have the most data for, and that's the open approach. But there really is no prospective randomized trial uh, that actually compares robotic to open surgery. So we have to try to assimilate and try to understand uh, how we can compare the two techniques um, with the data that's available. Uh, there are certainly retrospective studies uh, suggesting equivalence uh, in terms of outcomes compared to open surgery. Uh, some studies show better outcomes for robotic surgery. Uh, and then there are some studies that show worse outcomes for robotic surgery. I think one of the uh, first studies that gained a lot of popular attention was published in 2009 uh, by Jim Hugh, and this was published in JAMA, which is a very uh, respected and widely distributed journal. Uh, this looked at the comparative effectiveness of what he termed minimally invasive versus open radical prostatectomy. This was based on a large uh, kind of database uh, uh, of patients and outcomes. Again, several limitations of the study, uh, but drew attention because uh, the con one of the conclusions was that while men uh, undergoing, we'll call it minimally invasive prostatectomy compared to open surgery, experienced shorter lengths of time, fewer respiratory and miscellaneous surgical complications and strictures, they also had similar post-operative use of cancer therapies, but men who had the minimally invasive approach experienced more genitourinary complications, incontinence, and erectile dysfunction. So again, many limitations brought a lot of controversy to the field of, you know, what type of surgery should we be doing, and really highlighted this. But it's, it's also, I found it very curious because the same author, you know, in the same year or a few months later, uh, wrote, you know, why I perform robotic-assisted prostatectomy despite more incontinence and erectile dysfunction. So, you know, Jim Hu is, a, is a, again, a, another surgeon who does a lot of uh, a prostate operations and only does it robotically, and, and I, I agreed with this in the sense that it's really not about the robot, right? It's about the surgeon. And I think that's, uh, again, the, the most important thing that we uh, can try to focus attention to. If you look at the, uh, and this number is probably even higher in 2012, going on 13, uh, the types of treatment that are, are available for localized disease, um, for better or for worse, uh, the vast majority of patients are now having robotic surgery for their prostate cancer, or their localized prostate cancer, if they choose a surgical option. Um, again, I think, what do the current studies tell us? Well, number one, there's no, what we call, a, clinicians will refer to as level one evidence or the best type of head-to-head -head evidence. There's really no good evidence that systematically compares the two techniques. A lot of the studies are based on Medicare uh, information and whether it's a single or multi-institutional uh, data uh, to look uh, at outcomes, and these are really limited in their applicability. Uh, and certainly we've noticed a trend towards uh, higher utilization uh, of uh, minimally invasive approach for prostate cancer treatment. Uh, one of the studies that I was involved with uh, a couple of years ago was trying to, again, look at outcomes when comparing techniques. As I said, there's no head-to-head -head randomized trial, but for this particular study, what me and my colleagues were able to do is look at uh, cohorts, different cohorts of a little over 500 men who underwent open prostatectomy, laparoscopic prostatectomy, and robotic prostatectomy. And this was based on a number of men in a, a single institution database. We tried to match these patients so they all were about the same age, uh, the race was the same, PSA levels were about the same, biopsy and clinical stages were about the same. So we're really trying to get uh, different cohorts of men that had the same type of disease and look at the different uh, surgical approaches. And what we found, at least with respect to cancer control, uh, one of the, the criteria for how we can define good cancer control is surgical margins, particularly for patients whose cancer is still confined to the prostate. And if we look at that particular um, uh, variable in this study, we saw that the positive margin rate, while there were some slight differences between the techniques, there was no statistically significant difference when you looked at surgical margin rates for what we call organ-confined disease among the different techniques. When we took this out to look at another surrogate, that is what the PSA level does 
after surgery, there were no differences between surgical techniques uh, when we looked at biochemical, what we call biochemical recurrence rates, um, suggesting that regardless of the approach, you can achieve good outcomes. Uh, again, I think uh, pointing to uh, other factors that may contribute to uh, differences, uh, whether it's complication rates or cancer control rates. One of the more recent studies uh, looking at perioperative outcomes, again, took uh, advantage of another uh, nationwide uh, inpatient sample, they call it, or database. Uh, and this particular study, uh, in contrast to the one that was published a few years ago in the JAMA, actually found uh, differences in uh, the two surgical techniques, that is the robotic uh, and the open approach, in favor of the robotic approach uh, with respect to decreased blood uh, transfusion rates and overall complications. And this looked at well over 15,000 men uh, in a large database. And of course, as one would expect, uh, length of stay uh, was shorter for a minimally invasive approach. So I think what do all these studies tell us? Uh, I think that it tells you that the robotic approach can perform as well as an open approach and vice versa. Uh, with further adoption and refinement, certainly there are, are all, multiple ways that we can improve surgical technique. I think that the uh, robotic system is now, for example, in other types of cancers taking uh, advantage of a, a fluorescent uh, based approach and trying to identify anatomy uh, that may help uh, improve surgery. And I think that the bottom line is that regardless of which approach that you pick, that it's the surgeon, not the technique, that truly determines outcomes. I wanted to end uh, this uh, topic uh, of uh, surgical treatment, if you will, of prostate cancer with a little tidbit about HIFU, because HIFU, again, is high-intensity focused ultrasound, is not yet FDA approved in the United States, but is commonly used actually in uh, the UK and, and Mark Emberton over at the University Hospital in London probably has the world's experience with this type of approach. It takes uh, advantage of the fact that there is an ultrasound uh, probe uh, that can direct a uh, ultra ultrasound beam uh, that will be able to ablate or destroy uh, tissue and it can, they can focus this uh, uh, several centimeters away from the actual probe itself. Uh, it's typically done as an outpatient uh, and uh, patients, uh, again, can be uh, treated uh, in this manner. And they've been doing so in London for a number of years. This is the most recent study that has been published uh, out of the UK group that looked really at the application of what's called focal therapy uh, for localized prostate cancer. And I think Dr. Chung gave a very good talk about uh, in order to set this up because you want to figure out, well, if you're the patient, am I, is this a good treatment for me? You know, if, is surgery a good treatment for me or is radiation going to be a good treatment if you have localized disease? And what they initially tried doing with HIFU was to destroy or ablate the entire gland and they found a lot of uh, potential complications with that um, that I won't go into uh, in detail and, and this takes it a step further. If you can select the appropriate patient with, who may not have too much cancer, again, based with the limitations of the biopsy, and that's shown here, for example, this big red star represents uh, a, a major, if you will, uh, prostate cancer on biopsy, and the green one may actually represent a lower grade, a uh, Gleason 6, or a small amount of biopsy. And what Emberton's group did was actually just go ahead and target certain areas of the gland, as highlighted by the rectangle or squares here. So if you had a prostate cancer that was localized by biopsy and or MRI, MRI is something that they use very commonly in the UK, which we actually have very limited use of in the United States, um, they would perform an ablation of just this part of the gland. If you had a situation where the biopsy showed cancer on one side, a very low grade, but a more aggressive cancer on the other side, they would ablate the major lesion and leave this particular lesion untouched because as Dr. Chung had alluded to earlier, these types of cancers, as indicated in green here, would represent lower stage, uh, lower grade disease that may never affect uh, a man's quality of life or outcome uh, in the future. And so you would target perhaps uh, the cancer that may be more life threatening. And again, a very small study, uh, but was published in Lancet Oncology earlier this year, 42 men recruited. And in 30 of 39 patients who underwent uh, this procedure, they had no histologic evidence of cancer identified uh, when they were re-biopsied at six months. Uh, 36 men were free of what they defined as clinically significant cancer, so perhaps the higher Gleason grades. 
And one of the concluding sentences, obviously, was that uh, there is certainly promise in focal therapy uh, for uh, individuals uh, and it, when trying to use it in a more limited fashion compared to a whole gland ablation may actually uh, result in better, a better side effect profile. So again, HIFU I think is uh, one of the technologies for treatment of localized disease that we have to uh, carefully watch. I think it does present uh, perhaps one of the next best um, uh, potential treatment options down the road with what's available today. Uh, we'll look forward to some of the uh, potential uh, clinical trials that I know are in the works which may be coming to the United States next year, and hopefully we may actually be a part of and, and try to get uh, involved with at Stanford. Um, right now, HIFU in the United States is only available uh, for treatment of what's called recurrent disease, if cancer were to come back uh, after radiation therapy, uh, but uh, is uh, available outside of the United States um, uh, in its current form. So with that, I just wanted to close and uh, thank everyone for their attention. I think there are many goals of contemporary surgical management. Uh, number one is to perform uh, the best uh, possible operation you uh, can do for cancer control while decreasing morbidity. I think that patients these days also are, are, are different many from years past. Obviously, everyone is thankful and, uh, you know, with the priority of trying to achieve cancer cure, but there are, are a lot of other bits, the internet, the World Wide Web, everything has, has opened the, the book essentially to people to try to do their research, uh, to look at websites, you know, watch videos, try to assimilate everything. And of course, uh, in this day and age, uh, you know, we, cancer control remains at the top of the list. Um, and patients really like having choice about what they want and uh, also have other priorities. People are, are functioning, uh, living a lot longer. Uh, they want to get back to work want to get back to normal activities. And I think that uh, really helping and trying to identify what treatment is best for each individual uh, is most important and trying to do uh, the best possible um, uh, you know, treatment, whether it's surgery or radiation while minimizing, minimizing side effects, I think is uh, also uh, equally, if not most important. So again, I wanted to thank you for your time and I'll turn it over to Dr. Skinner and, and Dr. Srinivas. Thank you, Mark. For, for the, and I, I apologize that we don't have a radiation therapist here, just out of interest in time, but we, all of us can talk about radiation in terms of individual questions if you have some. Our last speaker is Dr. Srinivas, who's going to focus on advanced disease. That's one of the areas where there actually are some of the most exciting changes in the last couple of years. Good morning, and I'd like to welcome all of you, and thank you for spending your Saturday morning with us learning about this disease. So before I start, I just wanted to briefly introduce uh, where we are with prostate cancer and put some of the treatments in perspective. So for most patients with cancer, we think about stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four. While that's important in prostate cancer, there are several other things that are really important to us as clinicians and as research investigators as well. And I just wanted to briefly walk over the slide. So in prostate cancer, stage is really important. So does one have disease that's confined to the prostate or is it outside the prostate? So that's the first question we really want to ask. And some of the talks that you've heard this morning really focus on this localized disease. The second question is, if it's not localized, where is this disease? Is it manifested just by the blood test, which is the serum PSA? Or do patients have disease that's spread elsewhere? And uh, as Dr. Skinner pointed out, usually when this disease comes back, it's either by PSA alone, or it goes to lymph nodes that you can detect by CAT scan, or usually it's to the bones, which is detected by bone scans. So that's the second question we want to ask. And third Third and perhaps the most important in terms of clinically significant is all men start off with normal levels of testosterone and the key really in this disease is that this disease is driven by testosterone. So. Um, we treat most patients who have a disease that's come back aimed at lowering testosterone or making testosterone 
are unavailable to the tumor cells. Those treatments really work for a brief period of time, but eventually these tumor cells become very smart. They learn ways to grow outside of this maneuver, and they become castrate resistant. And that's uh, really a key in understanding why this happens. A large amount of effort has been spent on that in the last decade almost. So the latter part, when you become castrate resistant, again, there are people who have just PSA alone as their marker of disease, or they have metastatic disease, either to the lymph nodes and to the bone, and a large majority of patients, they have no symptoms. So that's an important part, that each of these patients, so prostate cancer is not just one disease. We have different patients in different groups, and the way we treat them and what their outcomes are going to be are quite different as well. So here is a slide that just shows you the, where we started and where we are today and what the promise for the future is. So as I said in the beginning, that really uh, prostate cancer is driven by testosterone. So back in the 1940s, it was discovered that by removing the testicles, which is the major source of testosterone, testosterone resulted in dramatic improvements for patients. Their pain got better, their PSA dropped, and patients actually felt better. This really led to a Nobel Prize for this discovery that testosterone is what drives these tumor cells. And then it was almost three decades later that we found chemicals that could do the same thing. And that's the common injection called Lupron that's typically used. And Lupron does the same thing as surgical removal of the testicles in that it lowers the testosterone in the blood. And then as you can see, it took another, in the mid-1990s, chemotherapy began to be used for this disease. And I have to say in breast cancer, we have at least 12 approved drugs that can be used for breast cancer, but in prostate cancer, we'd have three drugs. So that clearly tells us the pace at which the research is in prostate cancer. We feel we are a decade behind breast cancer. But in 1996, for the first time, we had a chemotherapy that was used for patients with prostate cancer. And then in 2004, there became a second chemotherapy drug called Taxotere or Docetaxel, which is typically used today. But what I really wanted to focus was the last three years. So if you can look from 2010 till now, there's been six drugs that have been approved by the FDA for patients with prostate cancer. And I think this is just the beginning of what's to come. And while typically these drugs are used in more advanced disease, the promise for the future is that as we get to learn more about these drugs, as we find more of these innovative and creative drugs, we'll be using them earlier and earlier on so that we can truly talk about not just making patients' symptoms better, but perhaps curing a larger number of patients. So uh, this is a simple cartoon just to tell you how um, this disease works. So I've said over and over again that this is really driven by testosterone. So essentially, testosterone is produced predominantly in the testicles. And there's another small fraction that's produced in the adrenal glands, which sit on top of the kidneys. So irrespective of where testosterone comes from, it gets converted into this active component called dihydrotestosterone or DHT. And what happens then, this DHT then binds to the androgen receptor, which is really sitting in the prostate cancer cell. And the minute this binding happens, where DHT binds to the androgen receptor, it then promotes this whole machinery. It goes down into the nucleus of the tumor cell, binds to the DNA, and that's what makes PSA go up, the cell proliferates, and it has the ability to spread. So really, you can see from this that from a simplistic point of view, what we want to do is either lower the testosterone or make DHT unavailable, I mean, make anything that cannot bind to the androgen receptor. And that's what I'm going to show you in the next several slides. So. Almost all patients, when we give them drugs like Lupron, it works quite well. It works in lowering the PSA, patient symptoms get better, and they could go on for many years with their disease being controlled. But eventually, 
you know, it's hard to know how many years, but predictably patients who go on these therapies and stay on these therapies, these tumor cells become really smart and they learn to grow despite treatments such as Lupron. And that's what we call the castrate resistant state, or we call that as CRPC. Why does this happen? And I think this has been the focus of research for almost a decade now. And I like uh, this paper as one of the best papers that I've read, which actually comes from one of our colleagues up at Stanford who's spent all of his life really learning about the androgen receptor. And not to make this too confusing, but you can see up here, this is the same androgen receptor. And in blue is the DHT binding to the androgen receptor. What happens to these tumor cells, they learn, they now realize they don't need this much of testosterone to survive. They have now found a way where they can just grow with just this much of testosterone. They have become so smart that the prostate cancer itself makes its own testosterone. And it's really understanding this that led to the development of many, many drugs that I'm going to talk about next. So here is the first drug that I want to talk about. It's called Abirateron or Zytiga. And this is a drug now that's been available since 2011. And we have really learned how to use this drug quite well. And simplistically, this is what happens. So in your adrenal gland, you have a lot of very important uh, hormones that are made. And there are really three types of hormones. There are mineralocorticoids. These are glucocorticoids. And this is where the adrenal androgens are made, and these androgens can then get converted to testosterone. So what abirateron does is it blocks this important conversion whereby the adrenal androgens almost become undetectable when you give patients this drug. So this was first tested in a small group of patients. So this is called a waterfall plot, and basically what it is is each bar is an individual patient. So when patients were given this drug, abirateron, this is what happened to their PSA. So here is a zero mark, and you can see that the majority of patients had a drop in their serum PSA. In this group, you had like four patients who didn't respond at all to this drug. So this is a pretty remarkable discovery that these were patients who had refractory disease, they have gone through chemotherapy, and here is an oral drug that you can give them that has this dramatic decrease in PSA. So this, having seen this hint of activity, this was then taken to a large trial where a group of men who had prostate cancer, who had disease that had spread to their bones, who had actually had chemotherapy, were then randomized to this drug, abirateron, versus placebo. And for us in medical oncology and for most trials in um, cancer, we are looking at what defines benefit. Right, we want to see, so specific to prostate cancer, if we give somebody a drug, we want to see, does it drop your PSA down? Does it make symptoms better? And does it make bone scans or lymph nodes smaller? And that's what we call as uh, having no evidence of progression of disease. But ultimately, we don't care what happens to the PSA. The goal of any drug is to make somebody live longer. And that's what we call as overall survival. And here is the chart up here showing you that for the group who got abirateron, there was a prolongation of overall survival compared to placebo. Now, this difference is about four and a half months. And for you sitting in the audience, that might seem like it's so trivial. But this is just the median. And you should look at the hazard ratio in this. And if you really look at that, it shows that there is a 40% less risk of dying by going on this drug compared to placebo. Now, clearly, this is big for this group of patients who have actually gone through a variety of therapy to find a drug that has an impact on overall survival, which is a very high bar to reach. 
So I want to talk about a second drug, which has also just been approved last week by the FDA and is now available to patients called MDV3100, or it now has a name called enzalutamide. So this drug is slightly different from abirateron in that it doesn't lower the adrenal androgens, but what this does is if there is any circulating testosterone, if there is any circulating androgens, it prevents the binding to the androgen receptor. So remember I told you those three steps that testosterone or DHT binds to the androgen receptor. It then comes into the nucleus of the cell and then it binds to DNA. This drug prevents all three from happening so you actually have a true tumor kill and a cell death. So because of uh, this mechanism was understood. Here is a similar waterfall plot that I showed you previously. And you can look at patients who had chemotherapy or those who did not have chemotherapy. And again, the majority of patients who were given this drug had a pretty dramatic drop in their PSA. So a similar trial was done, again, looking at patients who had chemotherapy and they were randomized to this drug versus placebo. And here are the results of that trial. This again demonstrates that the group who got MDV3100 had a prolongation of their life compared to those who got placebo. And all of the other things that I mentioned to you that demonstrate benefit, PSA coming down, symptoms getting better, uh, bone scan showing improvement, all of those were in favor of this drug compared to placebo. So it was on the basis of this that led to the approval of this drug. But again, it, right now it's specific for patients who have had chemotherapy. And um, there are a lot of trials, and I'll come back to that in the end, showing is there any benefit in taking this on to an earlier group of patients. So I want to move on a little bit and just talk about the vaccine in prostate cancer. So this has been around now for uh, two to three years, but this is really remarkable discovery in terms of science where you can actually take a vaccine to treat a cancer. So how does this work? There are cells in our body called dendritic cells. These are really the uh, cancer, the, these are the immune cells, and they are the ones that really put up against infection and a variety of things. So there's been a lot of work, some really pioneered here at Stanford looking at vaccines. And so one of the things that were done is to take these dendritic cells, but by themselves, they are not completely great. So if we were to take them outside of the body and mix them up with this antigen, which is present on prostate cancer cells called PAP, prostate acid phosphatase, and mix it with a drug called GMCSF. So by doing this, we are just making this dendritic cell all revved up and really active. So you take patients' dendritic cells outside of the body, you mix it up with this antigen and GMCSF, and make a vaccine, and that's what's called Provenge or Cipolucil T, and you infuse it back into the patient. So the idea here is that this is now going to go in and seek any tumor cell that actually has the PAP on its surface, and it's going to go and kill the tumor cells. So does that work? So this is how the logistics is, that on day one, patients get their blood removed only for these dendritic cells. The rest of the blood is given back to the patients. And this is then sent to the manufacturer up right now in New Jersey. And it's sent back to the doctor's office and it's infused back into the patient. Now you do this three times. You do this at week zero and then two weeks later and another one two weeks later. So in six weeks, you're done with your three treatments. And what were the results of this trial that led to the approval of this drug? It's a large trial called the IMPACT trial. And again, this was done in patients who had 
evidence of metastatic disease who were castrate resistant, but really had no symptoms. So vaccine in general is again, you know, just like you saw, there are certain candidates for robotic prostatectomy, certain candidates for surveillance. That's same true for drug therapy too. Not everybody's a good candidate for something like this. You want the vaccine to have its time to work. So in general, you want people who have very few symptoms or ideally those who have no symptoms at all, they were randomized to either the cipulosal T or to placebo. And these were the results that were seen that the group who got cipulosal T indeed had a higher survival compared to those with placebo. So cipulosal T is available to patients today, but one of the downsides about cipulosal T is that it doesn't make your PSA go down. It doesn't make your lymph nodes get any smaller. It doesn't have a huge reflection on what your bone scan does. So a big uh, area of research is trying to figure out who best is a candidate for cipulosal T, and there's a lot of work in that uh, area that's happening right now. So one of the better ones is, so clearly cipulosal T is a little uh, labor intense. You have to have your blood drawn. You have to have it mixed. So the next area of research is really looking at a shelf vaccine. Can we just take something off the shelf that might be um, have the same level of immune effect. So that's the next uh, generation of vaccine trials. One is called PROSTVAC, where they actually take two different type of viruses, mix it with three different proteins to sort of make it just like cipulosal to make the T cells work better, and it's infused back into the patient. So this drug in an earlier trial has shown to have almost similar magnitude of benefit as Provenge, except that I think this will be a lot more user friendly compared to uh, Provenge. So this is a large trial that's again going to look at this PROSTVAC versus different types, adding different types of drugs to it versus placebo. And I'll show you in the end that we are hoping to have this trial opened at Stanford within the next month. So clearly these sort of treatments would be a good um, uh, option to have available. So I want to close up in the last uh, few minutes talking about uh, different other drugs that are in the pipeline and what's to come. So one of the issues with prostate cancer is unfortunately as it gets to your bone, patients can get symptomatic and have bone pain, which is certainly a huge area of focus for us to want to decrease pain and suffering. So we have had medications called radioisotopes. So basically, they are intravenous medications that can be given, and they are like radiation treatments, which go specifically to the bone. There have been treatments like this in the past, but they have a long half-life. They stick around in your body for a long time. They cause your blood counts to go down. And they've really, other than decreasing pain, they have not had a huge impact on the prostate cancer itself. So this is a novel drug called alpha radin. Basically, it's radium-222. And if you look at the periodic tables, radium-222 is in the same place as calcium is. So why is that important? That we think that this is a calcium mimic. So wherever there is calcium, this drug is going radium-222 can get to where there is calcium. And in prostate cancer, that becomes really relevant because all of the bones have calcium. So for a patient who has bone metastasis, if you can find a drug that gets to the bone and not just get to the bone, but release those radium particles in the bone and cause tumor death, that would be a remarkable uh, discovery. And that's what this does. And the, here is just a small chart showing you that the benefit with these alpha particles is that it has a very short radius. So it only goes for a small diameter, so you don't get blood counts that go down. So here is a drug that may have an effect in killing the prostate cancer cells in the bone, but not have a huge impact on your blood counts. So is this real? 
So there was this trial that took patients who have bone disease, who had pain and who had symptoms, and were randomized to either this radium-223 or placebo. And sure enough, you know, this has been a huge uh, impact where this drug caused a decrease in PSA, it caused a decrease in pain, but more important, it actually made people live longer. So this is, again, a huge impact, and we think this is going to be a great options for our patients to have, especially those who have pain and who have symptoms where uh, chemotherapy might be a little bit harder to give. So we should have this. Uh, tr this is not yet FDA approved, but um, we hope it will get approved maybe sometime by next year. But we have this available for patients at Stanford within the next two weeks. So should there be somebody who needs it, we are happy to have that option. So I think I'm going to just close with um, uh, this one drug just to introduce you to yet another new drug and what's the future ahead, that there are many, many drugs like this in development which we think would change the way prostate cancer is changed, uh, will be treated in the next five years. So here is a drug called cabozantinib. I know it's a huge name, but I really don't expect you to remember this name by the end of the talk, but just wanted to give you a um, uh, just a glimpse of what types of research is happening, that this is a drug, again, it's an oral tablet that you would take. These are now not like chemotherapy, they are really targeted drugs, and this drug, cabozantinib, targets two specific proteins, one called MET and another one called VEGF, and again, you can see the same waterfall plot where this drug resulted in a dramatic drop in PSA, but perhaps the more impressive one one is this bone scan. So Dr. Skinner showed you the bone scan in the beginning for how patients with prostate cancer end up having bone involvement. So here is a patient whose bone scan was uh, at baseline, and 12 weeks after taking this drug, look at the change in the bone scan. That's pretty dramatic, and you can see two examples. This almost looks like a normal bone scan. So clearly there are drugs like this in the pipeline that we hope will change the, um, the way prostate cancer is treated and have some benefit for a larger number of patients. So I leave with this slide just demonstrating some of the clinical trials that are open at Stanford for patients with more advanced disease. We have that drug enzalutamide or MDV3100 clearly based on its activity in patients who have had chemotherapy, we are very anxious to bring this drug on in the earlier phase of disease. So this drug will be part of a clinical trial for patients who have had recurrent disease. So these would be patients who have either had surgery or who have had radiation and who then have their PSA go up. We want to test this drug to see if this would be of some benefit in the earlier stage. For patients, again, you know, that's the vaccine trial that we think will replace Provenge or maybe an easier way to uh, deliver this called Prostvac is soon going to be available. I think chemotherapy is an important option. While we want easier treatments, we don't want to give up a treatment that really works. So we want to keep chemotherapy and we are looking for ways to make chemotherapy better. So we have a vaccine in combination with chemotherapy that we are studying. And then I just mentioned the drug cabozantinib will be available as well, as well as the um, radium-223. So I think I'll stop with that, and this will give us time for additional questions. So I'm going to have all the um, uh, speakers come up. As usual, we're all very passionate about what we do, and we've driveled on a little bit longer than we should have, but we'll try to answer as many questions as we can. Um, we're officially supposed to end at 11, so if those of you have to leave at that point, I don't know when they'll kick us out, but I think all of us probably can stay a little bit longer than that. Um, if anybody has a question that they'd like to start with, yes, sir. Um, how, how uh, right now, I'm taking for my own treatment, Zomara.
bones need to be protected. And uh, Zometa is a drug that's uh, typically given for patients who have disease that's gone to the bone. There are some newer drugs, but uh, Zometa works just as good as some of these other drugs as well. Dr. Chung. So, yeah, so uh, the question was uh, essentially what the candidacy is for watchful waiting, and how does one determine whether or not the cancer grows to a point where um, they're no longer confined to the prostate, no longer curable, is that your question? I want to just make sure I paraphrased it. Yeah, basically, uh, as I, uh, just to uh, reiterate, the um, uh, watch for waiting is typically reserved for what we would call low risk cancer. And typically what that means is cancer is not palpable, you can't feel it on a rectal exam. Your PSA is less than 10, your Gleason score is six, which is the lowest, and you have a few cores out of generally 12, that have cancer with a small focus of cancer in each core. So that generally constitutes what we call a low risk or very low risk cohort or population of prostate cancer patients. Now, you know, following patients is a whole different story. Um, I think the bottom line again is that we have to be as, as um, thorough as, and as, uh, as uh, careful as possible. And what that involves is, you know, serial, you know, every three months PSAs. Um, Three, every three months, getting another digital rectal exam, and you know, at least initially, every six to 12 months, getting another biopsy. Um, that way, we have the best tools available for us to uh, assure that uh, we know exactly what we're dealing with. Of course, that's not 100%. Um, until we have better imaging modalities, until we have better markers, tumor markers, better tests other than PSA, you know, there's no 100.0% guarantee. But um, as the data shows, that appears to be a, quite a safe um, route to follow patients, um, provided they're well chosen right off the bat. Uh, here in the front. What could I do to prevent having prostate, prostate cancer? So there were also some questions that were written down about diet. So who would like to attack that? Mark, do you have a comment on diet? I think, you know, there isn't really any good scientific data that would necessarily advocate a specific diet. We get this question a lot from patients who are uh, either on supplements. We see a lot of patients who try uh, to take soft palmetto. That's probably at the top of the list. Um, there is some limited uh, science from the laboratory that should that may support some chemicals that exist in, for example, pomegranate juice of all things. Um, so in general, I counsel patients to try to lead uh, a kind of what we consider to be a healthy li lifestyle. We know in general, uh, as, as it may apply to some types of other cancers, uh, you know, avoidance of red meat. There is also some data that suggests there are certain chemicals, particularly in charred meat, that when hamburgers, for example, get cooked to very high temperatures, that can contribute to the cancer process. Uh, so again, I, I would advocate eating healthy, um, you know, whether that's lots of green leafy vegetables, um, but I don't necessarily have any specific diet to recommend to patients. As, as Dr. Chung mentioned, most people, even when they have prostate cancer, die of heart disease. So anything you're going to do that's good for your heart is also good for your prostate cancer. There is a really nice small book by a fellow named Mark Moyad, M-O-Y-A-D, and I forgot, it's called Prostate Cancer or something or other, but he's a nutritionist and he has a really nice description of every supplement, what the data is, and the, he's a very reasonable guy, so that's a, I would recommend that to you if you want to look into diet. Uh, in front. Yeah, uh, Dr. Chung's presentation. You talked about minimal use of MRI in the U.S. for mm. prostate diagnosis. Why is that? Yeah, MRI is a, um, is a modality that has a lot of promise from a prostate cancer diagnostic standpoint, but right now the data is, I would admit, to be conflicting and somewhat con and somewhat limited to suggest its use, especially in a low-risk patient, especially in a patient who we're following, because the ability for MRI to even find cancer in the first place is quite limited. So to use that as a modality to follow patients, unless until we have better tools with which we can use MRI to see cancer, again, as Dr. Gonzalo alluded to, once we have that, then we're going to be able to focally treat with, say, HIFU or a cryo or whatnot, rather than take the whole gland out. We're not quite there yet. I think we're getting there, but we're not quite there yet. And once we get there, then the whole game is going to change with regards to prostate cancer. There, there's a ton of 
real basic science work going on to try to improve our imaging. And a lot of that is going on at Stanford. And I think we're all very um, optimistic that five years from now, maybe 10 years from now, we'll have a better way of seeing the prostate cancer, but it's just not here yet. How about in the way back? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can you uh, speak to other tumor markers uh, for monitoring such as PCA3? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm certainly no expert in that. The person uh, in ex who's expert in that is in our department is someone named uh, Jim Brooks. He's really on the forefront with regards to um, kind of alternate markers to, to better delineate uh, trying to better progn prognosticate or predict which cancers are going to be aggressive, which ones are going to not going to be aggressive. I don't think it's just going to be a marker situation. I think it's also going to be a gene notyping, gene mapping, you know, cytogenetics. It's going to, you know, it, it, these are things that um, are, you know, obviously in development, but, you know, not obviously ready for prime time. But, you know, again, you know, the, the crux of the matter is trying to predict which cancers are going to be remain unaggressive for a long period of time, which ones are not. And trying to get to that, um, that answer is, is somewhat um, elusive. Uh, in the green shirt. How subjective is that Gleason score? If you give the same slide to 10 doctors, how many are going to give you? Are you going to get 10 giving you the same number or are you going to get a variety? Sure. Again, we you try to limit variability among interpretation because as uh, this gentleman pointed out, uh, the diagnosis of the exact Gleason score is really based in 2012 and moving forward into the relatively near future uh, by a pathologist. What we typically will recommend to patients at least is to sort of have just like you would a second opinion for almost anything medical is to try to get another uh, reading or interpretation of the biopsy slides or uh, the pathology slides by a pathologist who has specific training in uh, genitourinary pathology, someone who really looks at prostate cancer basically all day long. I think if you can assure uh, that someone with that type of training uh, reviews the slides, then you can certainly have uh, a good deal of comfort with that particular diagnosis. But there is uh, uh, some subjectivity in, in reading. Yeah, but, the, but it's not, nowadays with so many biopsies being done, I think that maybe 10% of the time will they actually change the Gleason score, maybe as high as 20%, but there's a pretty good consistency. A lot of doctors in their office will send the biopsies to a central lab for rather than sending it to their local small hospital, so that's helped a lot, I think. Um, there was a question about cryosurgery. Mark, can you talk about that for a second? Sure, uh, so cryosurgery, uh, has been offered uh, for a number of years now. We know that there are actually some uh, community physicians who do cryosurgery as pr what we call primary treatment for prostate cancer. As you notice in my talk, I did not list that as uh, something that, uh, at least as an academician, we consider to be standard of care for uh, initial treatment. I think the, the best use of cryotherapy and one of the, the largest cohorts is actually back at, at Hopkins is the use of cryotherapy for treatment of recurrent disease. So in a patient, for example, who has had radiation therapy and now has a detectable and perhaps rising PSA level and is looking for options for treatment, I think cryotherapy represents a very uh, good choice. Uh, or at least one choice that is a, a possibility for treating recurrent disease. And again, just like any treatment, it is also not without potential uh, side effects, um, but I, I think that's what I view uh, the current state of cryotherapy in, in the United States. Another question in the front in the black shirt, or gray. Gleason score of six. Gleason score, Gleason score of six. Sir. Uh, <coughs> how many uh, uh, times can you have uh, CAT scans <laughs> and the road scans after yeah. you have uh, radiation therapy? The, the, there's not any interrelationship of those two. Radiation gives radiation just very locally. Um, we don't think that combining radiation with CAT scans and bone scans is dangerous. We've all become much more in tune to the amount of radiation that you're getting. And in fact, at Stanford, every CT scan we order, it pops up on the screen how much radiation that's going to give to the patient so we can take that into consideration. Somebody with advanced cancer, 
the trade-off usually is well worth the knowledge that we get from the, the uh, x-ray, but if you don't have advanced cancer, you don't want to have CT scans every six months because it does add up. In the way back. Oh, you heard, uh, this medicine we take it for like a blood thinner or rostron, and those are even causing the prostate cancer. Is that true? I'm, I'm not aware that the blood what thinners, the, the blood, do blood thinners cause prostate cancer? I'm not aware of that. Well, there have been every, there have been so many things that have been linked to the uh, cause of prostate cancer, but many have really not panned out. So it's like reading the paper that one day caffeine is good and next day that it's bad. But to this date, we have really not had any uh, clear linkage of any of those blood thinners to prostate cancer. Sandy, can you just comment, one of the questions that was written was, how do you decide when somebody comes in your office with advanced cancer, what order to give these drugs that are now approved? We, I sit on a panel that sets up guidelines for exactly questions like this. It's called the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. So it's totally based on what the level one evidence that Dr. Gonzalgo spoke about. So what's the data that supports the use of these drugs? So many of these drugs are expensive. There's a lot of out-of-pocket costs for this involved. And without taking those into consideration, we really want the right patient to get the right therapy. So for, uh, for the most part, the right answer would be sticking to where it's been tested. So for instance, Provenge or the vaccine is really not for patients with localized disease. You don't want to take a drug like that and take it in lieu of having these curative options. So our practice, and I think the right way where we are with medicine now would be to stick with where it's been tested and where it's shown to be useful. So for the most part, we would stick with that guidelines where I showed you where it's it's been tested, and in order to have access to these drugs, that's where clinical trials really come by, and you really want to be part of a clinical trial program where you're being watched closely, and we learn in the future whether this is the right setting to give a particular drug. Yeah, so that, that's something we uh, will talk with patients about. So the question is, is there anything that could be done to minimize the variability of the PSA test prior to being uh, drawn? I mean, there's certainly a few things that we know can increase a PSA test. So uh, infection is, for example, one uh, thing that can cause a, a PSA test to go up. Um, you know, actually natural enlargement of the prostate or BPH can cause a PSA level to rise, not acutely or, or rapidly, but can certainly be a cause to rise. The other thing patients may come into the office to have their PSA drawn and tested is uh, recent intercourse or more specifically ejaculation or manipulation of, you know, the, the fluids uh, associated with that prostate. That can cause uh, another uh, a rise in the PSA. So trying to avoid those types of uh, activities so you don't necessarily want to have uh, an ejaculate, you know, the, the night before or even, you know, within, I would say, 24 hours of a PSA test that might falsely elevate that um, just to make sure that you're not having an infection or instrumentation. Sometimes uh, people will have procedures, you know, more specifically related to urology like cystoscopy or, or something of that nature, but any type of um, manipulation of that area, even in a, a very vigorous or extensive type of prostate uh, manipulation or exam can, can cause a PSA to, to elevate. I don't know if anyone has any other thoughts on other things that might increase a PSA? The, the only other thing is um, bike riding. You know, the bike seat in and of itself is somewhat positioned to irritate your prostate, actually. So, you know, if you're an avid bike rider, you know, occasionally you'll see patients who are avid bike riders, especially in this area, and that can raise the, rise the PSA, and sometimes they need to take a little hiatus on the bike riding itself before we recheck it. Ben, there was one question about repeat biopsies, and what's the danger of doing that? Yeah, so, I mean, you know, obviously, I tell patients all the time, doing a biopsy, nobody wants to do a biopsy, right? I mean, you know, it's somewhat invasive, and, you know, it's somewhat, you know, it's going to be some discomfort, and that's, that can't, you know, I don't want to discount that. What's the ultimate risk of a biopsy? Well, you know, the ultimate real risk of a biopsy is, is, is infection. What's the risk of infection? Well, the published literature suggests the risk of infection from doing a biopsy is about 3 or 4 percent, and that seems to be what our rate here at Stanford is as well. So, low risk of infection. Um, sure, there's discomfort issues. You know, those are not long-standing and they're transient, but the risk of infection is quite low, just to lay everyone's fears. 
we don't really have evidence that it spreads the cancer, which is a really common concern. It's actually hard to spread prostate cancer. If you inject it into a mouse, it's hard to get it to stick. So we don't so far have any evidence that it spreads the cancer, but it's a reasonable question. I'll take two more questions and then I think we need to wrap it up. Uh, sir in the gray, right behind you. For, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, you can puncture a it a lot. I mean, there's, there's no, you know, it, it sounds a little, right, it sounds a little, um, you know, it's not intuitive, you know, well, we're, you know, puncturing the rectal wall each time, how can that not cause a problem? Well, it actually doesn't. I mean, for, for once, you know, for, for one reason, as Dr. Skinner alluded to, you know, we're not going to spread cancer. I've had patients ask me that, you know, of the, I don't even know how many hundreds of thousands of biopsies that have been done. You know, I've nev never really seen a case report of uh, spread of cancer, nor have I ever seen one myself. But right, I mean, the, the risk of infection and safety, uh, again, you know, there's, uh, unless you're a chronically hospitalized patient who would be at risk of multi-drug resistant bacteria in the first place, you know, yeah, there's gonna be an increased risk of infection, but you know, repeated biopsy is not gonna necessarily impart uh, in, in, uh, increased risk of uh, some sort of rectal din danger or rectal injury. I just want to add one comment. There is actually some data that shows multiple biopsies can contribute to ED, or erectile dysfunction, because the neurovascular bundles lie essentially in the, in the same region that they're biopsied. And the other thing to consider, for uh, many active surveillance protocols, uh, many of them adhere to guidelines, uh, and after, say, a course of biopsying every six months or a one-year time period of negative biopsies, frequently they're spaced out so that you're not getting biopsied every six months or one year, and in fact, the biopsies will then be performed perhaps every two years or, or uh, with a uh, greater time between the biopsies. Did you still have a question in front? Yeah. The surgical treatments talk about positive margins and assessing where to make the cuts. Is, is there an open process that the doctor can use his hands and feel and you don't have that opportunity with the robotic method? You want me to do that? Well, I, yeah, I'll, I'll just comment as an open surgeon. That's the way I was trained, and I like being able to feel there. Um, and but I have to say that the the data suggests that the posit in the hands of somebody who's experienced the the worst thing is to find somebody who's just done the surgery a few times. And that was I think in that initial publication showing that robotic surgery did worse was partly because there were a bunch of new robots out there and a lot of surgeons learning how to do it. If you look at experienced surgeons like these guys and other people out there who have done many hundreds of robotic surgeries, the positive margin rate is similar or even lower than open surgery. So I, you can't really argue with that. And I also wanted to add that, you know, again, the question alludes to can you actually feel the, the cancer? and you know, in the vast majority of cases, uh, especially with PSA screening and how we diagnose prostate cancer today, uh, the cancers are not palpable, uh, at least from the, you know, the, where we can do the, the exam. So uh, in, in many cases, if it's caught early, it's still organ confined, and uh, the tactile sensation may be less important than if you had a big palpable tumor that, that was actually there. I don't want to discount the palpable, you know, the feeling, the tactile sensation, because that's obviously important. But if you look at the data, it's not really in favor of open or robotic for regards to that. So I think basically what you're maybe losing a little bit from a tactile standpoint, you're making up for in magnification three-dimensional vision. Yeah. I'm gonna, um, we're gonna close because of time. I would love it if you all would fill out the evaluation form uh, and drop it off on the way out. And um, I think all of us will stay for a few minutes if you have specific questions. Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciated your attendance and uh, hopefully everybody learned something today. Thanks. Thank you.